Hello, everyone, and welcome to our conversation beside the virtual fireside. Uh, we're here to talk about the ILO Global Business and Disability Network's new self-assessment tool. I'm Susan Scott Parker, uh, the strategic advisor to the ILO Network, and my colleagues are the famous Jürgen Menzer from the ILO Global Business Disability Network, and Neil Milliken. Are you famous because you're from Astos or because you're the new chair of the ILO Global Business Disability Network? I'll take my turn whichever way. Whichever way. So before we talk a bit about the self-assessment tool, I'd just like to ask Jürgen to put it in context for us. Tell us a bit about the ILO Global Business Disability Network and why you felt the time had come to, to, to produce, if you like, this new benchmarking tool. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan. Um, the ILO Global Business and Disability Network has been around for some 13 years, and from the very beginning, the idea and the mission of the network has been to bring multinational companies together to exchange among themselves um, best practices on the inclusion of persons with disabilities with a focus on employment, sharing good practices, supporting each other on their journey. We currently have 36 multinational enterprises in this global network, including, of course, Atos, represented by Neil here. Atos also being the chair of the network this year, next year. We also work with um, more than 35 national business and disability networks, which are country-level platforms of companies working uh, on disability inclusion and some non-business associate members. So the whole idea is to promote the employment of persons with disabilities in the private for-profit sector, especially also in developing countries. And uh, we, when companies join the Global Business and Disability Network, they sign a charter with 10 basic disability inclusion principles. Many years ago, uh, we created already a self-assessment tool aligned with these 10 principles of the charter. But we felt that um, the previous version of the self-assessment tool was simply a bit outdated, maybe, um, not ambitious enough. And at the same time, we saw more benchmarking tools coming up, which we, from the ILO and the ILO Global Business and Disability Network, wouldn't always endorse. So um, we felt the time was ripe to uh, revise the self-assessment tool, make it more ambitious, um, and um, make it m even more relevant than the previous tool. And so we started out with probably 12 months worth of consultations, looking at existing benchmarking tools, looking at efforts around the world to encourage companies to define and deliver best practice. And of course, as um, Jürgen explained, not only was the tool out of date, but private sector business leaders who were being asked to improve their performance were getting very confused by all the conflicting messages. And so many of the existing tools or benchmarks or indexes, whatever they were called, were grounded in local legal frameworks or in assumptions that were very grounded in a certain way of looking at the world if you're in America or you're in Venezuela or wherever. And so what we tried to do was to look at the universal principles that shape the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the universal human rights principles and other labor rights that are enshrined in the ILO's range of uh, labor market conventions, and say, could we find a way to develop a tool that would enable any national business leader to, we think in two hours, in consultation with leaders across the company from technology and procurement and property and customer care and of course HR to get a sense of where they stand against these universal principles. So the tool as it stands now has 47 questions um, divided into four sections because another reason we did this is there's always been confusion in so many of the instruments that the private sector are asked to use between what is required if you're going to deliver equal opportunities, treating people equally, recruiting people on a basis of equal, um, and what was culture change, and what was to do with customers, and of course, what was to do with corporate responsible citizenship, if you like. 
um, in the sense that we see more and more businesses now investing in their communities in ways which help to create job markets that because they enable disabled people to get the skills employers are looking for, work to the benefit of both business and disabled job seekers. So we've got the 47 questions into these four uh, domains. And we're confident that it will enable the national business leaders to see where they stand, take stock of where they need to make progress. They can then share that information with companies locally, should they choose to do so, because of course this is a confidential tool. And perhaps through the business disability networks that Jürgen mentioned, as a collective spot where they're all coming short. None of us have got it right on property, so perhaps we develop a, a tool that enables our, our members in, in Kenya or wherever to actually get a more consistent approach to creating the accessible built environment that is win-win for everyone. There's another aim here, of course, which is absolutely crucial, which is that multinationals should be able to use it to ask, say, 50 of the countries in which they operate to do it locally, and then it will, in effect, tell the national business leaders what, where the gaps are, what they need from head office if they're actually going to be able to drive consistent, fair, and sensible treatment of people with disabilities worldwide. So before I say anything further about the actual tool, um, I wanted to ask you, Neil, thinking of what a head how head office works in so many of the companies in the membership of the GBDN, what do you think is going to be the appeal? Why do you think global companies will start to use this? So I think the appeal is that it is only 47 questions and two hours worth of consultation because finding two hours, even, even two hours, which seems like not a lot in the diaries of extremely busy individuals is actually quite challenging. Um, and I think that having that top level view enables them to have a conversation amongst themselves because it's through them actually asking themselves the questions that they really realize because you can send reports. My email inbox is full of unread things. By actually asking the leaders to ask the questions of themselves, well, how are we doing on this topic or that topic, they are required to think about it more than if they were just reading about the, the report from someone else or in a meeting where someone else was telling them about it. The participation is important. I also think that it's only part of the puzzle, but it's a really useful part of the puzzle because as an organization that's got fairly complex and well-developed programs, we want to drill down deeper and, and we want to have really good data. But it's a pointer uh, and we can use that and we can also, as, as the chair of the GBDM, we want to make sure that the organizations that are members, it's certainly my ambition to drive the organizations that are members to take more action. And, and that means that we need to support the representatives of those companies at the GBDDN to have the framework to enable them to get the support that they need to to make change within their organizations. So to deliver the, the, the most important thing, the fundamental mission of ILO, which is decent work. And that's decent work for everyone. That makes a lot of sense. I think I want to come back to what you were saying about needing to dive deeper. We're not pretending for a moment that these 47 questions, yes, no, that's the answer. But what we did do was to say, it doesn't matter so much in a funny way. If you've got a policy regarding the built environment or a policy regarding accessible tech, what really matters is that you've got a named senior executive whose job it is to figure out what best practice looks like for him or her in technology, say so that they should then dig down after they've got their assessment and figure out what the IAAP and other standing set or broader standard setting bodies have done with this, what the property should look like. We recommend they work to the um, ISO standard for the built environment because local building codes are always inadequate when it comes to what a business really needs to deliver in that domain. 
And so what I'd like to see here is that you've got a named senior executive on the ground in Nigeria whose job it is to improve the accessibility of their built environment. They start to do their homework and they then report back to head office in Brussels or New York to say what guidance, what standards are we supposed to be working to? And then as happened with GSK, their head of global property decided what we need is a global corporate standard that lifts us into best practice above any local building codes, which as I say are always inadequate. And so GSK then sends out across their entire operation in what, more than 100 countries, the kind of practical guidance, a corporate standard on the built environment which enables their property people to work towards consistency with the approval of head office. But head office has sent down something that facilitates that, that movement. But what I'm really trying to get at here is we're not pretending that those 47 questions are the answer, but they give an indication to someone who's paying attention of where further, further work, further detail is required. And so I gather that we're seeing real interest worldwide. You've said something about translations already starting to appear, but we just launched it in December. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yes, there's, uh, ever since we launched the revised version of the self-assessment tool at the Global Annual Conference of the Global Business and Disability Network in November last year, I have also had many uh, bilateral conversations with the multinational enterprises that are part of our network, and I haven't heard any, um, or most of the responses have been very positive. Some are still debating, uh, because, of course, it would mean... Um, engaging country offices again on, 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 on disability. Some have done it with tools that we wouldn't have necessarily endorsed, but there's a lot of interest uh, in, in the membership base of the Global Business and Disability Network and hopefully beyond. Just to emphasize, the tool is free of charge. It's publicly available currently as an Excel um, spreadsheet format. We'll turn it into an interactive uh, platform also with uh, collaboration of the UN Global Compact, uh, which has some 17,000 uh, company members. So I think there's a, there's a great potential to bring it to a wider business audience that has maybe not considered disability as much as the companies that are in the Global Business and Disability Network. As Susan just mentioned, uh, we are having <clears throat> now ready a Spanish version of the tool, a German version of the tool, Arabic uh, should be available in two months from now, French also in the next few months. So, of course, we want to make it accessible, not, in, not only in, in the sense of technical accessibility, in terms of screen reader accessibility, but also language accessibility. Um, Susan mentioned it's a very, uh, we have 47 questions, very easy to answer. They're basically binary answer options, yes, no, with the option also don't know, because you might just don't know. And also already in the tool having <coughs> links to resources for each, almost all of the questions that help companies then to see, look, we see, we have a challenge there. Is there any publicly available guidance that we can look at to already think about how do we do this in our company? And um, the good thing is that, yeah, as, as, as Neil said, look, um, Neil uh, works in head office, and it's easy, for, I mean, easy, it's never really easy, but it's good if you then <coughs> uh, have the local colleagues, so to say, look at it, and at head office, you can then do the mapping and see um, this goes well in all of the markets, this is going well in some of the markets, but not in others, why is that, and can we learn from the markets where it's going well? Or you might see um, that once one question is never answered the way we would like to see it in any of the markets. And of course, um, then the, 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 the hope that the company would prioritize that. But yeah, we make this uh, as accessible as possible and uh, collaborate, as I said, with the UN Global Compact. The Valuable 500 are also interested in promoting the tool. As I said, it's publicly available, free of charge. Anybody can use it. Um, it's, it's, it's mostly for bigger companies with, with country operations around the world, but any company can use it, and um, no, no information is uh, retained by us in the ILO. We would, of course, also like to hear back from companies that use the tool, how it was for them, just the process of the collaborative effort, 
um, Neil said, even you know, getting two hours of all those who should look at it um, and bringing them all into the same physical or virtual room can be a challenge. But I'm happy to hear, Neil, that you confirm this is probably more manageable than uh, other tools that are around. So thanks. And I think for me, I'd like to stress two particular strengths. What we see with existing um, indexes, if you like, or benchmarks or whatever they might be called, is that it's not clear what is actually required if you're going to treat people with disabilities fairly, equally, versus what's nice to have and helpful, for example, having an ERG, an employee resource group for people with disabilities, always very helpful. So we've made a very clear distinction between the basics, we call it the fundamentals, which is how you make the adjustments, how you've got people responsible for the being barrier-free for groups and adapting for individuals, which is how you treat disabled people equally. And then we move into the kind of things you can do and should do in terms of culture change, which we know are really important, always learning directly from people with disabilities, whether they're colleagues or customers or community stakeholders, absolutely essential. The second thing we did that I think is quite different and certainly was a first for the ILO is we added questions about your approach to being barrier-free and welcoming customers with disabilities. I think this has been an area where those involved in economic empowerment have missed a trick in the past. One, it captures the attention of some people in a business to talk about customers who might regard anything to do with disability as naturally belonging to a junior diversity manager. This starts to position this in, in the context of business priorities. But also what we find is when you start to remove the obstacles that prevent disabled people from spending their money with you, you're starting to make it easier on the employment front. The, the premises in the retailers are easier for employees and for the customers. The online stuff starts to work better for everyone because your IT people are st starting to focus on what accessibility really means. And I mean, years ago, we saw the story of a company that had trained more than 20,000 frontline people in their stores to welcome disabled customers, including deaf customers, and they started to get all kinds of really good job seekers who were deaf applying for jobs because the deaf community was getting the message that if you welcome me as a customer, you might even hire me. So you get a, quite a virtual circle there. I mean, Neil, with your expertise on the you know, on technology and accessibility. How could you see that dimension of getting the technology people and the property people all lined up with procurement, as we've tried to do, rather than assuming that this is somehow just an HR priority? Well, first thing is we're not running our programs from HR. We work closely with HR, but I actually sit at a parallel level to HR. So, um, so that gives us the ability to address things transversely. Um, I, I want to come back to the point that you made about policies. Um, policies are, are fantastic, but they can just sit on a shelf. So it's really about whether you have processes, and, and this is where the tool is important because the tool is uncovering whether or not you have functioning and working processes to include people. Um, rather than a policy, because a policy is just an intent. And some of these indices that we alluded to give people good marks for good intentions. And of course, we, we have to have good intentions. We want to do the right things, but we've also got to put in place the, the frameworks and the business backing to do that. So I think being able to measure that and have people responsible is a really key aspect of, of organizational maturity on disability inclusion. The other point you made was looking at the different geographies uh, and, and how that might also um, differ between different parts of the organization. So it's useful exercise to go out to the different geographies. The one thing I would say is that it's very interesting to see how culturally different countries react to the same questions and react to actually quite similar answers. So we've had exercises like this before where two different countries gave pretty similar sets of answers and one rated themselves really, really badly and was extremely harsh and 
on themselves and the others were going, well, we have agreements in place, we're doing well. Uh, and, and so I think that, that it, again, using something like this enables you not only to measure the, the reality of how an organization is doing, but the perceptions as well, because the perceptions in the management in the different parts and different countries also impacts on how you deliver and impacts on people's expectations. So I think being able to expose them and allow people to compare and contrast within the organization is also a really useful exercise. And that's certainly one of the reasons we have put into the 47 questions things like, do you monitor employee satisfaction mm -hmm. with your workplace adjustment yeah. service? I because I circled back, I didn't answer your question, which was about the technology. We are well, a that's not a surprise, Neil. We are a technology company, um, and we deliver services, and we try to design them to be inclusive. And we, we do it in a way so that we can create good jobs um, that are not separate but, but properly included. Um, and that we do this, we provide technology services. So we're also hopefully enabling our clients to employ people with disabilities and to be helping them along their path to maturity through using technologies that work for people with disabilities as well. And as I said in the previous chat, it, we, we want to make business from doing this. So it's showing that there is a viable business delivering services for people with disabilities as part of the ecosystem in the tech uh, industry. So all of these things add up to, to us making progress. There's lots of different elements. I think we shouldn't be too upset with ourselves when we find there are gaps. We should be excited because the gaps are also opportunities. And so when I see a don't know, that's actually an opportunity for us to actually start exploring and start asking more questions so that we can understand where we can improve in the business. Well. Certainly when we look at who our target users are, of course we're talking about global companies, but we're also talking about business disability networks, being able to use them on the ground. Jürgen, would you like to just say a bit about how you could imagine what, you've got more than 30 national business disability networks, and how you think it might be helpful for them? Yeah, thank you, Susan. And um, yeah, I think it was about two weeks after the launch of the revised self-assessment tool, thanks also to, to Susan's idea, to just bring the national business and disability networks together in a workshop. So as I said, these are country-level um, platforms for companies on disability inclusion issues, similar to what we do at global level, just at national level. And since the self-assessment tool of the global network is really targeting, or it should be, responded uh, to by national leaders, we felt that it was worthwhile organizing a specific meeting to make the national, the coordinators of the national networks firstly aware of the existence of the tool and, and not only about the existence but the benefits because these national networks sometimes struggle to know well what they should actually deliver for the companies at national, at country level. What are the most pressing issues? Where can these national business and disability network at most value when serving their membership base, so companies at, at, at country level? So we sat together in a virtual room with the coordinators of the national business and disability network, uh, explained the tool, answered the questions, because they can basically um, um, well, we encourage them and some already confirmed that they will send the tool to their company members at country level. Um, hopefully many of the companies are then willing to share the results with the national business and disability networks in each of the countries so the national networks can then identify and prioritize action, design services, tools, publications for the companies at country level. So that's that's, um, I think, a very useful tool, of course, for multinational enterprises, but as you said, Susan, specifically also for the national business and disability networks, of which we have more than, I think now it's 35. So we can still create some 150, by the way, <laughs> worthwhile. And, and I think I'd like to add to that before we finish. Um, we also saw the need for organizations of persons with disabilities with an interest in influencing business or the NGOs that 
get funding to help people with disabilities into employment to get a consistent view of what is reasonable to expect from a company because often they've got little experience of the reality of working inside a business. And so we see this as building the business confidence of the disability sector as well as building the disability confidence of the business sector. So we would encourage anyone who is working with a company, helping them to uh, build, you know, improve their disability performance, to use this tool so that both sides of the table get a better understanding of what is realistic, what is required, and what is really helpful when you're trying to shift cultures. So, as the coiner of the term disability confidence, I, 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 which I love, and um, I think that we need to go beyond confidence to competence, uh, and tools like this are an important part of that journey towards competence, because we, we need to understand where we're failing, where we're doing well, uh, and what we need to do and what processes and, and, and what resources we need to put in place to, to enable uh, our businesses to, to get better at this, to, to become part of our business as usual. Um, because it should be just the way we do stuff within organizations. Mm -hmm. Frankly, it's not yet, but that's why we're all here, because we're working on it. And yes, you remind me, I did coin that phrase, disability confidence, ages ago. But can I remind us it had four thingamajigs. One was, I understand how the impact of disability and my disability performance on my organization. Two, I'm barrier free for groups, access. Three, I adapt for individuals, accommodations or adjustments. And four is I don't make assumptions about human beings on the basis of a label which happens actually to work out to be the core of what the self-assessment tool enables. And it happens to be what the CRPD would require of the private sector if it applied directly to the private sector. So I'm optimistic that this is a, a hugely important next step, if you like, in the, the journey that the ILO Global Business Disability Network set out some 13 years ago to expedite was to improve the disability performance of large corporates because of the potential impact on the lives of hundreds of millions, and as allies, enabling business to work alongside people with disabilities to create a, mo a more effective system, if you like, that is supposed to enable the economic contribution of us all. So thank you very much. And thank you to the Zero Project for giving us a chance. And please do get in touch if you'd like to be a launch partner and help us to encourage every company that you work with to do this. Launch partners at the moment include Access Israel, Innova in, uh, in Canada. And so we'd like a very long list. So do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you.